We'll move to questions without notice. You'll be in continuation. Senator Ayres. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Could the minister live on the new start rate of $40 a day? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and, uh, and I thank the senator for his question. Um, first of all, can I say um, that nobody is saying that it would be easy to live on New Start, um, and that's why the coalition's policy in relation to uh, to New Start has been one that has been entirely focused on job creation and creating pathways to a job. Um, and the one thing that this government will Order. absolutely commit to is that anybody who is on Newstart, anybody who has not got a job, that we will, as a government, work our absolute hardest order. to ensure— Order. Senator Rustin, on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, the question was very simple. Could the minister live on $40 um, a day? You have reminded the minister of the question. I remind ministers they must be directly relevant, which is a tighter test than the word relevant that previously existed. Um, I'm listening very carefully to the minister. Um, I notice you are too, Senator Watt. Um, I call the minister to continue. Yes, as I said, no one has ever said that it would be easy to live without a job. But that is why this government is so focused on job creation, but not just job creation, and our track record on job creation stands for itself. 1.3 million jobs in the last term of this government and a plan to create another 1.25 million into the future, but also creating the pathways so that people who are looking for a job will be able to access the jobs that are created. And through uh, my colleague, the Minister who's, uh, for Employment, Minister Cash, and through her job active services, and also through my area of the disability employment services. And last week I explained to you about some of the fantastic things that we're doing with disability employment services, is because this government is absolutely focused on creating jobs and creating pathways to jobs so that order. Senator Watt on a point of order. On relevance. This, the question is very simple, and the minister is going nowhere near it. Could the minister live on $40 a day? Yes, no, maybe. Um, we haven't well, got anywhere near it. On that point, Senator Watt, um, minister, I cannot instruct the minister how to answer a question, uh, but I, I, no, I do, I, the, the question was quite specific, and it is difficult to um, rule material extraneous to such an answer, but I, I do call the minister. Direct relevance is a, a stricter test than relevance. Um, and there has been some time for context, so I ask the minister to turn to the question. But I remind senators I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question, and that includes whether a one-word answer would be appropriate. Senator Watt. Senator Rustin. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will reiterate: no one has ever said it would be easy to live without a job. <laughs> Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Consistent with her views on the age pension, does the minister consider $40 a day generous? Senator Rustin. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said uh, to the answer to my original question, it would not be easy to live on, uh, on, on New Start, um, and neither would it be easy to live without a job. And that is why this government remains so tremendously focused on job creation and creating pathways to people who want a job to be able to get a job. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. In an article entitled Nats defy PM over New Start increase. It is revealed that last Monday National MPs requested the party's parliamentary policy committee review the economic impact of raising New Start. Has the government undertaken any economic modelling of the economic impact of raising New Start? If so, will the minister undertake to provide it to a coalition colleagues? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, we haven't made any particular promises, but what I can say is the coalition's policy in relation to this matter has not changed. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is demonstrating it is on the side of Australians who want a job and update the, the Senate on the Australian labour force figures? For the month of June. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman uh, for his question. And it actually builds directly on the answer that Senator Rustin was given to the previous question that she was asked, which is, "This is a job-creating government." We make no apologies for the fact that we believe that the best form of welfare is a job. And since we were elected as a coalition government in 2013, we have set about to put in place the right economic framework so that businesses can prosper, grow and, as Senator Rustin has stated, create more jobs for Australians. And Senator Brockman, in relation to our home state of Western Australia, the most recent labour force figures Mr. President, for June of this year show that employment increased by almost 14,000 jobs. That is a good thing. The economy in WA is creating jobs. I'm also very pleased that in Western Australia we have a very high participation rate of 68.5 per cent. And what that says is that Western Australians are confident in the jobs market. They're putting their hands up and they are saying we want to participate. Mr President, we don't shy away from being a job-creating government focused on getting people off welfare and into work. Since we were elected in 2013, the economy, the businesses out there, has created almost 1.4 million jobs. And we continue to see jobs growth in Australia. And in fact, what the June labour force figures show us is that total employment in Australia is at a record high, with 12,871,700 Australians employed. But, Mr President, we also have record full-time employment. Over 246,000 full-time jobs have been created in the past year. We are a job-creating government. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I thank you, Minister, for that answer. Minister, are there any policy risks that the minister is aware of that could jeopardise these record figures? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, you can just hear from the outcry on the opposition benches, and I say the opposition benches because that is where the Labor Party is. They have failed to learn from the last, the most recent election. Australians put their hands up and they voted for jobs. They understood at the May 18 election that the greatest risk to the economy were the Australian Labor Party. They also understood that taking to the election a promise to tax Australians an extra $387 billion is not a job-creating policy. They then fought, if you recall, Mr President, tooth and nail to oppose the tax relief that we have now successfully delivered to the Australian people. Mr President, we are a job-creating government and we understand you need to put in place the right economic framework so that businesses out there can prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians, and that's Order. what we're doing. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what actions is the Morrison government taking to continue to grow our economy and ensure that more Australians are given the opportunity to find a job? Senator Cash. Well, well Mr President, those on this side of the chamber understand that you cannot take economic growth for granted. You also need to understand that governments themselves don't create jobs. What governments do is put in place the right economic framework so that businesses can prosper, grow and create more jobs. That is what the role of government is, and this government is doing that successfully. We have a strong economic plan. We want to return and will return under the leadership of our Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann, the budget to surplus in 1920. And Mr President, that is something that those on the other side have not managed to do since 1989. We know that infrastructure projects create jobs, and that is why we have a commitment to a $100 billion infrastructure project. We've passed, we've passed our tax relief for hard-working Australians because we know it's their money. We know it's their money and they deserve to keep Order. more Senator of it. Cash. Senator O'Neill. Mr President, and my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. I refer to Minister Taylor's claim that the EPBC listing affecting his own interests had the potential to affect, and I quote, thousands of farmers in his electorate. Can the minister confirm that there is only one compliance case 
under investigation in the region. The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr President. And I would refer uh, the Honourable Senator uh, to the statement given by the member for Hume in the House earlier today, in which he steps through the representations that he received in 2016 and 2017 uh, from farmers across uh, his electorate. Uh, he steps through the communications he'd had with representative bodies for farmers as well, all of whom are outlining their concerns around this issue and in outlining order. their concerns— Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. I'm well aware that the minister is trying to step through an awful lot at the moment, but the reality is my question asked if there was one compliance case under investigation in the region, and the minister has gone nowhere near that. In fact, he looks like he's going on a ramble. Oh in response to the minister's I'm, statement, not my question. I'm listening carefully, Senator O'Neill. I, I believe at this stage the minister dealing with this is relevant to the preamble before you ask that question, but I am listening carefully where you provided some context for your question. The minister is allowed to address that. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I'd also point out to the senator the statement that uh, the member for Hume made. And he's been clear, as he has on multiple occasions, uh, that he has not engaged in discussions regarding compliance actions. And what he has done is represent his electorate in relation order. to matters Senator Wall, that have been brought to order. his Senator, his Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the question doesn't go to what the minister did. It is a question of this minister representing the portfolio to confirm as to whether there is only one compliance case under investigation in the region. That is the only question. You, you've restated the question, Senator Wong. Um, I am listening very carefully. Um, the minister has been speaking for 45 seconds. He is allowed to address the preamble as well. Um, I'm listening carefully to ensure something is direct rel directly relevant to part of the question. So I'll call the minister to continue. He's now been reminded of it twice by yourself and Senator O'Neill. So, Mr. President, as I've pointed out to, uh, to the senator, the member for Hume has outlined the representations he's received, the actions that he was taking on behalf of constituents. He has been clear that he has not been engaged in relation to any compliance matters. Uh, and uh, if there is information in relation to further compliance matters, uh, I will bring that to the chamber. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Order. Senator O'Neill is on. Senator O'Neill is. Senator O'Neill, I ask the centre table to lead by example. Senators Wong and Cormann. Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Can the minister confirm that the single compliance case? under investigation in the region relates to the activity on Minister Taylor's own land. Senator Birmingham. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it is on the public record the legal Order. structure as to the ownership of those lands as Mr Order. Sen Senator Wong, the minister has been speaking for seven seconds, and I actually believe he was being relevant at that point. Or Senator Wong? Yeah. Point of order, direct relevance, and I'll take the interjection that he's only been speaking for seven seconds. We'll give you leave for an hour, mate, if you actually answer the question. Order. Order. How about that? Order, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your Ms seat. Oh, you want to continue the point of order? The question yep. is not about company structures. The question is only about is only requesting that this minister confirm there is a single compliance case and it relates to Minister Taylor's um, land. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong, at the point he was interrupted, I was hearing him talk about ownership of land, which I believe is directly relevant to the question. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, in relation to compliance matters, Mr Taylor has been clear. He's never been engaged in relation to compliance matters. The public service have been clear. They've never been engaged in relation to compliance matters. And through you, through you, Mr. President, mate, Order. we have been, Mr. Taylor has been very clear in relation to the ownership, declaration of his ownerships, and I refer you very clearly to the statement that he made to the House on these matters. Um, Senator Wong, I'll take I'll take your well, Senator Wong, I'll take your observation. Um, 
It is not up to the chair to direct the minister how to answer the question. That is a matter for debate subsequent to question time and for, and for others to make judgments about. My only role here is, to, is, is the minister being directly relevant to the answer, to, sorry, to the question. And in that case, I believe the minister was, even if people didn't like the answer. Senator O'Neill, a supplement, final supplementary question. Has the minister arranged a meeting for any other landlords under investigation by the department with the relevant minister's office, the department and members of the department's compliance unit? Or is Mr Order. Taylor Order. the only landholder to receive that special treatment? Order. I ask for order on my right while the questions are being asked. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, Mr Taylor has been very clear he was representing constituents. He's outlined the timeline of receiving those representations and the actions that were taken. And in relation to the representations and the meetings with departmental officers, he has equally been clear, and I quote, that the official rights in inter internal correspondence that was released under FOI, that the meeting dealt with answers, question, answers on questions on the technical aspects of the listing outcome and highlights that they would stay out of completely any compliance action underway. And the official also writes, and he quoted, we will confine our discussion to the EPBC Act listing process. They were the matters brought to the member for Hume's attention by his constituents. They were the matters that he raised on behalf of his constituents. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Can the Minister update the Senate and how the government is demonstrating its commitment to Australia's national security with its plan to ensure that the Royal Australian Navy has an effective submarine capability. The Minister, Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, for that question and for his ongoing commitment to our naval capabilities. I'm very proud to be a member of the Liberal National Government that is committed to the security, stability and prosperity of Australia. And, uh, Mr President, through you, I would uh, note Senator Gallagher's incessant uh, interruptions here, and I'm not quite sure whether I should be amused uh, or a bit alarmed at consistent uh, interjections, uh, or maybe mildly amused. But, not alarmed. but he might not want to hear this, uh, but this is a great thing for your home state of South Australia, Senator Gallagher. Uh, and this, this naval commitment to $90 billion investment stands in stark contrast to the complete abject failure of Senator Gallagher and all of his colleagues on that side to commission a single Australian-built submarine here in Australia. So, The attack class submarine, the centrepiece of this program, will provide Australia with our next regionally superior submarine capability. The security of Australia is paramount to this government. That's why we made the critical decision to protect Australia and its national security by acquiring this capability in an increasingly contested environment. This government also continues to invest in Navy's existing fleet of Collins Cast submarine to ensure it remains a potent, fit-for-purpose capability. The six Collins class submarines now incorporate the most advanced technology globally of any conventional submarine and they continue to excel in their operations across our region. Three of the six submarines are consistently available for tasking, with one in shorter-term maintenance and two in long-term maintenance and upgrades. As we construct 12 new attack-class submarines in South Australia, this government will be putting in place a prudent transition plan, including through-of-life type extensions to the Collins, yeah. to ensure the effective operation and the continued operation of our submarine fleet. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Could the minister update the Senate on the progress of the attack class submarine? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. As I said, the Liberal National Government has made a firm commitment to build regionally superior submarines in Australia and in South Australia in particular. Again, unlike the Labor government, who made no progress at all during six years in office, we have got on with the business. This year alone, the government has taken uh, significant steps. We signed the strategic partnering agreement with Naval Group on the 11th of February this year, which details the enduring provisions under which the Commonwealth and also Naval Group will work to design, construct and deliver the attack class submarines. On the 25th of February, uh, Naval Group and ASC signed a framework agreement to develop a sovereign operational and sustainment capability right here in Australia. 
The submarine design contract was signed on 1 March this year. This contract is worth more than $600 million and will see the design work progress through until 2021. We have made great progress towards delivering the attack class submarine under a clear plan and the leadership of this government. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Could the minister update the Senate on how the government is building the capacity to deliver on the government's naval shipbuilding plan? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as part of this government's commitment to $90 billion investment in the national naval shipbuilding endeavour, we are also clearly designing and developing the workforce to match this new capability. To achieve this, we commissioned an independent critical peer review to assist defence in developing and also implementing an appropriate workforce plan to support and encourage growth of the workforce. I believe it is prudent that the government seeks this expert advice as we plan for our future Navy capability and, in particular, its workforce. I am pleased to report to the Senate that Navy has already made good progress towards increasing its workforce with initial entry training courses at near maximum capability. To help meet Navy's need for an experienced and sustainable workforce, Defence has also instituted a targeted retention program. Further to this, Navy's recruitment targets have increased by 40 per cent since early last year. The Royal Australian Navy and this government is committed to operating and supporting Order. Navy's current Senator and future Reynolds. submarine fleet. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Cormann. On 60 Minutes last night, the former Border Force Commissioner, Roman Quadvlig, said he was encouraged by several members of parliament, including two ministers, to help fast-track visas and airport entry into Australia for Crown Casino high rollers, including for international gamblers convicted of criminal activity who might not have otherwise even been eligible to apply for an entry visa. Will the Prime Minister name the two ministers implicated? Are they still in Cabinet? And what is the Prime Minister doing to investigate these serious allegations of ministerial interference to boost for Crown Casino? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for that question. Uh, the Australian government takes allegations of illegal activity very seriously. Everyone uh, is uh, required to abide by the Australian law. That includes casino operators, public officials and visitors uh, to our country. Our law enforcement agencies are working hard to disrupt and deter criminal groups by collecting evidence and intelligence about financially motivated crime. I will not provide specific details given the potential uh, to compromise ongoing investigations in relation to visa processing. Every application for an Australian visa must be assessed against national security character and health criteria. Applicants must satisfy the relevant criteria before a visa can be granted and there is no discretion for officials to depart from these requirements set out uh, in the Migration Act and regulations. I repeat that last sentence. There is no discretion for officials to depart from those requirements set out in the Migration Act and regulations, and that is that every application for an Australian visa must be assessed against national security, character and health criteria. Order. Um, have you finished your answer, Senator? So, Senator Waters, the minister has finished his answer. He's, he, he took his seat as he rose. I'll call you for your supplementary question. Thank you, President. How, how well timed. Um, given this and other recent scandals, it's perfectly clear that we need an anti-corruption body. The government's widely criticised model for a National Integrity Commission would not even allow investigations into these sorts of allegations to be, had a, uh, to be heard in a public arena. Does this government plan to progress its weak model, or will we see an ICAC with some teeth? And when are we going to see some legislation for an ICAC? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The government made uh, obviously relevant commitments in the lead-up to the election, and we will be progressing them as swiftly as possible. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Um, since 2012, Crown Resorts has declared donations of almost $700,000 to the coalition and almost $550,000 to Labor. How has this support influenced the approach government takes to issues surrounding Crown? And is this why the Prime Minister has turned a blind Order. eye to the alleged misconduct of at least two ministers? Order during, Order during questions. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, not at all, not in any way, shape or form. Uh, obviously, uh, under Australian law, uh, 
Australians are entitled and Australian businesses are entitled uh, to participate in the democratic process, including by making uh, political uh, donations. These have to be disclosed uh, consistent with our laws and are openly and transparently reported consistent with our laws, uh, and which is, of course, why Senator Waters is able to refer to them. Senator Billick. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. In a letter dated 24 July 2019, responding to a question taken on notice, Senator Birmingham said, and I quote, Minister Taylor has always declared his interests as required under both the House Register of Interests and the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Does the Minister stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. To the best of my knowledge and consistent with the statement the member for Hume gave to the House this morning, yes. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. In May, Minister Taylor acknowledged that he had failed to declare that he was a director and a shareholder in a company called JRAT International, saying, and I quote, it should have been. Does the minister still stand by his statement? that Minister Taylor has always declared his interests as required under both the House Register of Interests and the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Senator Birmingham. I refer to the previous answer, Mr President. Oh. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Oh. Given Minister Taylor has acknowledged his directorship and interest in JRAT should have been declared, Will the minister finally admit he should have made his interest in Jamland known when he met with the minister's office, the department and members of the compliance unit about a matter which would have had a material impact on that company? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, once again, in relation to, uh, to the interest in Jamland uh, and its relationship with the interest in Guffey, uh, that was detailed quite clearly uh, in, the in the member's disclosure, and which the member for Hume took through, and which the member for Hume took the parliament through in his statement to the House of Reps this morning. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture through his representative in the Senate, Senator Mackenzie. In 1996, the Liberal Party under John Howard decided to destroy farmers' property rights. It did so with the National Party's support. The two parties introduced draconian tree-clearing laws aimed to get Australia's compliance with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. The UN's Kyoto Protocol was an earlier version of the UN's Paris Agreement, designed to reduce the output of harmless human carbon dioxide. The human Liberal Nationals government was unwilling to artificially increase the price of energy to cut industrial CO2 output through climate regulations, so instead decided to remove the rights of farmers to manage their own land. Senator, does the National Party still support the Howard Liberal Nationals' decision to remove farmers' property rights? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, the National Party stands with Australian farmers to support their property rights, and we're very proud to be able to do that, both at a state level, uh, as is being indicated by LNP state members of parliament in your home state of Queensland, uh, Senator Roberts, who are fighting against the native vegetation legislation uh, that the Palaszczuk government seems so intent on sticking with and the impact it's having on uh, the primary producers in your home state. Uh, I'm, it was quite a long preamble. There was a lot in there. I'm very happy to outline our government's approach uh, to climate change and the impacts on agriculture. I'm very happy to outline uh, how energy costs affect our primary producers and our food processing sector, which you know employs hundreds of thousands of Australians, predominantly in rural and regional Australia. Um, but if, you're, if the essence of your question is does the National Party stand uh, with our Australian farmers to protect their property rights? Yes, we do. Senator Roberts, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. That's very interesting from the Senator because to get around Section 51, paragraph 31 of the Australian Constitution, that requires just terms compensation. John Howard, with the support of Queensland Nationals Premier Rob Borbidge and New South Wales Labor Premier Bob Carr, introduced legislated theft of farmers' property rights using the guise of native vegetation protection legislation, and these laws stole farmers' property rights. Senator, do you support the removal of farmers' property rights without just terms compensation? Uh, order. Senator Bernardi. Mr. Order President, as it's directly relevant to the question, could we add 
a happy birthday to the former Prime Minister John Howard as well. Um, Senator Bernardi. Um, Senator McKenzie. Still trying to get back to the Liberal Party, eh, Boris? Yeah. Well, um, and on that point of order, Mr. President, obviously the National Party uh, would like to say happy birthday to the former Prime Minister Howard as well, uh, and uh, thank you for raising it. Look, I, I can't be clearer, Senator Roberts, that our party and indeed our government supports farmers' right to farm. It's actually why we're introducing the Criminal Code Amendment uh, on agricultural production to ensure that farmers aren't going to be subjected to agri-terrorists and agri-activists seeking to go on farm and disrupt people's lawful way of doing business. Uh, our state members of parliament, I know, have been very strong and, uh, in prosecuting the case against the native vegetation legislation arrangements in your home state of Queensland, and they will continue to do so. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Senator, whether it is the UN's Kyoto Protocol, the UN's Paris Agreement, the UN's Lima Declaration, the UN's Rio Declaration for 21st Century Global Governance, whether it is open borders, immigration treaties, anti-Western human rights obligations and many other voluntary obligations to the UN, why does the Liberal National Coalition join with Labor and the Greens to continue to put the agenda of the Socialist United Nations ahead of the sovereignty, rights and freedoms of Australians? Senator McKenzie. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Mr President. Uh, you know, one of the aspects of the United Nations regime is the setting up the, the Food and Agricultural Organisation um, in Rome, who actually sees its role to unite agricultural uh, producing nations like Australia from around the world to tackle hunger and food security uh, of nations right around the world, and using science to actually do that. It's a fantastic example of countries working together, like Australia, to uh, use our expertise in primary production, use our expertise in, in science and innovation in this space to contribute to global hunger. So I'm very proud of our government's uh, commitment to always pursue the order. national interest. Order. Senator Hanson, on a point of order. Um, on a point of order, I don't think the question has been answered correctly. And I suggest that the minister take the question on notice because Senator, she doesn't clearly Senator understand Hanson. the difference between— Senator Hanson, please no, resume. No, you, you haven't raised the question. I can't direct the minister how to answer, how to an, minister how to answer a question. If you're raising a point of order on direct relevance, I, you are free to, but I can't direct the minister how to answer the question. It was very broadly worded, and I think the minister is being in order in the way she's addressing it. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. So, in answer to your question, our government always uh, acts in the national interest, and we make no apologies for doing so. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr President. <laughs> My question is also to the Minister for Agriculture, who I know doesn't need a representative in this chamber because she sits right in front of me. Um, would the minister kindly inform the Senate how the government is Order. demonstrating it is on Order. the side of our hard-working farmers and all Australians who want safe food imports? Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. If you import food, you're legally responsible to import food that's safe to eat. The Imported Food Control Act, together with state and territory food legislation, is the government framework that provides assurance to Australians that food sold here is safe, is suitable for human consumption and is compliant with Australia's food, Australia's food standards. Among its many important responsibilities, Fazance provides the agreed advice on the levels of human health and safety risk posed by some foods. <clears throat> Medium to high risk foods are those that may contain harmful natural toxins or pathogenic microorganisms that could lead to food poisoning if not handled or cooked correctly before consumption. For example, your steak tartare, your fresh oysters, your uncooked sprouts or your soft cheeses. Fazance provides the important food safety standards that states and territories use to regulate the domestic sale and service of food in Australia. However, it is the Department of Agriculture who is responsible for regulating food imports. All imported foods must firstly comply with Australia's biosecurity import conditions. For example, we do not accept meat products from countries we know have African swine fever. While not a food safety concern to humans, an outbreak of ASF would devastate our pork industry. 
Once my department is assured that biosecurity risks are managed, it uses the FASAN standards and advice to classify foods for particular inspection regimes under the Imported Food Inspection Scheme. Recent legislative changes are improving the operation of the scheme, and these include increasing importers' accountability for food safety, improving monitoring and management of new and emerging food safety risks, and improving incident responses. The changes help ensure that the scheme can respond to potential risks associated with growing complexity of globalised food supply chains and increasing consumer demand for imported food. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister inform the Senate if there is any truth to the rumours that Australia is going to ban Rockford cheese? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. But I really should be saying thank you to Mr Willstud, the big cheese, for drumming up excitement on July 12 with a tweet, Rockford to be banned in Australia. Au contraire. It is my pleasure to advise that the rumour is not true. My department is not looking to ban imports of Rockford, the French king of blue vein cheese. The department is merely carrying out a routine review of the certification arrangements between the Australian and the French authorities that allow the import of the raw, she raw sheep milk cheese. This is the second review undertaken since 2008 when we began to import the cheese. It is the same review process for all foreign government certification agreements and is consistent with codex guidelines and processes undertaken by other countries. We imported, and I found this unbelievable, 30 tonnes of Rockford in 2018. I am very confident the trade will continue. Senator Davey, final supplementary question. Thank you. And can the minister finally outline any risks associated with our food safety? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Rockford, uh, as outlined in an opinion piece in the Adelaide Advertiser by former uh, member Christopher Pine, Rockford is the royalty of cheese in the world made from raw, unpasteurised sheep milk. Milk of the special Lausanne sheep breed native to the south of France and matured in caves, no less. As my, my former colleague and self-confessed cheese elitist, Mr Christopher Pine, has increased the profile of this non-issue in his advertiser article. He raises his concerns about people consuming the mould that creates the stinking blue-green streaks in Rockford. And I note the mould in question is actually a penicillin, a widespread fungus that's used in most of our blue cheese. It is not the mould that is the food safety risk of Rockford cheese. As mentioned earlier, it's the raw milk that Rockford is made for, and untreated raw milk can grow listeria. It's managed the risk so the fixer can stand down. Order. Senator McKenzie. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. And I refer to Minister Taylor's claim that a letter from farm organisations dated 3 October 2017 is evidence he was making constituent representations when he sought a meeting with the Department of the Environment and Energy six months later. How can a letter written six months later inform the purpose of the meeting? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, once again, I would refer uh, this time Senator Wong to the statement made by the member for Hume in the House today. In that statement, he was very clear, speaking about representations and engagements he had had with farmers in late 2016 and early 2017 uh, regarding these issues. And indeed, as, uh, as Senator Cormann indicates, uh, this had been consultation dating back some period of time. Uh, this is about a local MP acting on behalf of his local constituents. Now we know that the only constituents those opposite are interested in acting on behalf of are of course their trade union mates and they don't seem to ever listen to local constituents otherwise. They certainly don't listen to the Australians who rejected their type of policy agenda at the last election. But on this side, we expect our MPs to listen to their constituencies, to engage in their issues and where appropriate to represent them. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. The minister has also tabled a letter from farm organisations sent in 2014 in relation to the listing. Can this minister confirm that Minister Taylor took no action in relation to the issues raised in the letter of 2014 until the day after Jamland Proprietary Limited was advised of its potential contravention of federal environmental laws some three years later? 
Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I again draw the members' attention to the answer I just gave that highlights the timeline as outlined by Minister Taylor in the House today. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister Taylor has sought to justify his actions by tabling a letter from three years ago, three years prior to the meeting, which he didn't act on, and a letter after the meeting. Isn't the truth this? Minister Taylor sought special treatment, and he got it. No. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the answer to that is emphatically no, and as the officials involved have been emphatically clear, at no point have the compliance issues been raised by Minister Taylor or in discussions with Minister Taylor. Order. 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 I will call Senator Van. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. Could the Minister update the Senate on how the government is demonstrating it is on the side of Australians who rely on affordable access to me medicines? And can the minister tell the Senate how many medicines have been listed on the pharmaceuticals benefit scheme since 20, 2013? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Van uh, for what I consider to be an incredibly important question. Uh, listing medicines on the PBS is a clear sign that the government is on the side of Australians. And Mr President, I am very pleased to inform the Senate that the coalition has invested over $10.6 billion, $10 billion in life-saving and life-changing medicines on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. What that translates down to, Mr President, is this. This is over 2,100 new or amended listings, and we know what those listings will do for the lives of so many Australians. These are listings that actually change lives, in particular for people who cannot afford these drugs if they were not subsidised. Those drugs can cost everyday Australians who so desperately need them hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. To be able to stand up and say, as a government, we have listed around 2,000 or over 2,100 uh, drugs does show that we are on the side of Australians. Mr President, we are currently averaging approximately 31 new or amended listings per month. That is approximately one new drug is listed every single day. And, Mr President, we will continue to list drugs and invest in medicines um, that are for the benefit of Australians. For example, in this year alone, we have listed a drug like Bavencio. This is a drug for treating metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma. It is a rare and highly aggressive form of skin cancer. If you didn't have that drug listed, you were probably going to be unable to access the drug itself. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Could the minister update the Senate on the policy framework that has achieved this? Senator Cash. Mr President, one of the proud achievements of this government is the listing of drugs on the PBS. And we on this side of the chamber know that that is only made possible by a strong economy. You will have heard the Prime Minister say time and time again, Australians understand the benefits and the dividends provided by a strong economy. They know for a government to be able to list a life-saving drug on the PBS, the government just can't pluck the money out of thin air. This government knows that, and that is why we are so committed to put in place the right economic framework that enables us to have a strong economy and ultimately show that we are on the side of Australians through dividends and benefits, such as an investment of in excess of $10.6 billion in life-saving and life-changing medicines on our pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. I thank the minister for her answer. How does this achievement differ from the approaches of previous governments? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, this is one of those areas that just stands in stark contrast when you look at what happened under the former Labor government and you look at what has happened under the coalition government since we were elected. 
We understand the benefits of a strong economy. Those on the opposite side don't. And because they don't understand the benefits of a strong economy, Labor, when in government, actually stopped listing, stopped listing life-changing drugs on the PBS. Why? Because they ran out of money. That is their track record on health. They stopped listing life-saving drugs on the PBS. And in fact, in the 2011 budget paper, it said this. The listing of some medicines will be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. Mr President, you either understand the benefits of a strong economy or you don't, and we're on the side of everyday Australians. Order. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question RSI. is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Minister, Pacific nations have identified climate change as the single greatest threat to their security, calling on Australia to do more to reduce its carbon emissions. Minister, you have said that Pacific leaders should be pleased with Australia's action on climate, despite rejecting their demand to end coal power generation and approving the Adani coal mine, which will be a massive contributor to climate change. With the upcoming Pacific Islands Forum in August, are you still planning on rejecting the demands of Pacific nations for Australia to do more on climate change? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Faruqi very much uh, for her question. In fact, uh, I was in Fiji at the end of uh, last week for the Pacific Island Forum ministerial meetings. The week before that, I was uh, in the Cook Islands to underscore our, relationship, our, our efforts to deepen the bilateral relationship there, Mr. President, and in the previous weeks in Papua New Guinea, in New Caledonia, uh, in New Zealand, and meeting with uh, a range of my counterparts uh, across the, uh, the region. We have made it very clear, Mr. President, that we are making a record contribution to the Pacific, develop, to Pacific development this year of $1.4 billion, which is all about addressing the issues that are of greatest concern to the Pacific. When we signed on to the Boy Declaration in Nauru, in Nauru at the Pacific Island Forum Leaders' Meeting last year, Mr. President, we acknowledged the fundamental nature of the challenge that climate change presents to this region. So we are working very closely in a range of uh, initiatives with our counterparts across the region. We are working very hard to demonstrate our commitment through a number of initiatives, Mr President, and the conversation last Friday in Suva illustrated the cooperative and uh, collaborative way in which ministers around that table are working towards the Pacific Forum leaders' meeting in Tuvalu this uh, coming month uh, in uh, August itself. And of course, Australia continues to support that process uh, as, of the development of the uh, Tuvalu meeting, which uh, they are very much looking forward to hosting. They will be holding a sotolunga on the Monday of the Pacific Island Forum, Mr. President, a round table with key leaders and ministers on uh, climate issues itself. Absolutely absolutely acknowledging our commitment in the region to make that contribution. Of our commitment, Mr President, we have expended hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars, Mr President, with our partners bilaterally and in a regional sense to address the things that concern them most. The introduction of the Australia Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific is predicated on addressing climate change, adaptation and resilience Order. for Senator all of Payne. the investments that will be made S under that facility. Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, a climate change strategy for Australia's overseas development program has been languishing in your office for over six months after you confirmed to Senate estimates in February that you received it. Minister, why are you hiding the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's climate change strategy from the public? When will you release it? And I'm asking for a specific date, please. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would have thought somebody of Senator Faruqi's experience would be way past believing everything she read. Uh, I would not have believed those reports if I were you, Senator Faruqi, because the position was made quite clear to those who requested the information and uh, not reported, uh, in our view, uh, as it was intended. The strategy is clearly being updated by DFAT to better reflect our international climate change engagement prior to the Paris Agreement coming into effect in 2020. Particularly noting, Mr. President, for those who were oblivious, that we have just had a federal election, and the government wants to take the opportunity to make sure that strategies such as this and other relevant documentation are contemporary and are relevant to the changes order. in our commitments, Senator which will Payne, be seen Senator under the Paris Faruqi Agreement. On a point of order. Uh, Mr. President, the point of order is to relevance. I did ask for a specific date of the release Senator of the report. Senator Faruqi, as I've said repeatedly, um, 
I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question, and when senators are taking points of order on direct relevance, they must remember they are, if they asked a longer question. Senator Payne is being directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think it's also important to remember that the Climate Change Action Strategy is essentially a departmental strategy. It's designed to provide strategic guidance to the aid program managers on climate change and on international development issues. And the department is already integrating climate change across Australia's aid programs and policies in close consultation with our Pacific neighbours, as I indicated Order. in my Senator previous Payne, question. Time for previous the answer. Expired. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu has said that his nation can be totally destroyed by the breakdown of the climate unless countries like Australia take some real action. So how can Australia actually go to the Pacific Islands Forum in Tuvalu in August without a strategy for climate change in the foreign aid program when you know that it is their number one priority? Good question. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I would remind Senator Faruqi that uh, in a, the Pacific Island Forum in 2016, Australia committed $300 million to address climate change and disaster resilience in the Pacific. We have spent nearly $200 million of that uh, funding in the past two years, and we will keep the international commitments we have made in these areas. We remain on track to meet our $1 billion climate finance commitment over the five years from 2015 to 2020. As I said, we, as in fact Senator Faruqi said, we remain on track to meet our Paris commitments. We are providing practical and meaningful support to our Pacific neighbours on climate resilience, and those at the other end of the chamber might not be interested in these practical outcomes, but others are, Mr. President. I've already mentioned our Australia infrastructure financing facility in the Pacific, which will support high priority climate resilient projects, including telecommunications, energy, transport and water. We've committed $16 million to address marine litter in our vast Pacific Ocean. We continue to work to mainstream climate change through our Order. development Senator program. Senator Payne, time for the answers expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Jerry Hansen, a member of the Western Australian Liberal Party, has been fined more than $60,000 by the federal court. Order for a, on my right, Senator Pratt. Please continue. By the, he's been fined more than $60,000 by the federal court for illegally blocking union officials from a building site where a worker had died after falling some 13 floors. Mr. Hansen has also been fined for exploiting foreign workers. Will the Prime Minister now call for Mr Hanson to be expelled from the party he leads? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Um, obviously, uh, all Australians, employers and employees and unions, uh, need to comply with the law. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, later this week in the House of Representatives and then at some point in the Senate, all senators will have an opportunity to ensure that uh, everyone is required to comply with the law. And that is particularly important on building sites. Now, uh, in relation to, uh, in relation to uh, Mr. Hansen, I mean, obviously uh, that same would apply to him as well. I'm aware of the report on the weekend. I'm also aware that Mr. Hansen has made clear that he has stopped donating to the Liberal and National Parties because, in principle, they were not listening to me. That's his, uh, that's, uh, his uh, quotation. Um, but I mean, Labor, of course, is quite dishonestly seeking to conflate uh, issues uh, here, um, seeking to conflate, conflate issues here. Uh, the actions of Jerry Hansen. To compare the actions of Jerry Hansen with the actions of John Setka in order to relieve pressure on themselves for their failure to remove him from the Labor Party. Order. Senator Cormann. Senator Wong. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, th this is uh, a question which relates to a fine uh, in relation to a circumstance where a worker tragically died. Uh, and it would, I think, be an appropriate thing if the minister treated the question uh, with a level of seriousness, given the seriousness of the, yes, of the really subject matter. Order. Um, I, I, you, you've reminded the minister of the nature of the question. Senator Cormann. Appropriately, Mr Hansen was subject to uh, court proceedings and the uh, law of the land was applied to him. Uh, the law of the land should be applied to all uh, actors uh, in this space without fear or favour. That, that is entirely appropriate. 
Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Mr. Hansen has donated as much as $175,000 to the Federal and Western Australian Liberal and National Parties over the last five years or so. <coughs> did, the, did Minister Cormann, Minister Cash or any other member of the executive solicit these donations from the law-breaking Mr Hansen? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As Senator Pratt uh, well uh, knows, uh, all political donations are declared consistent with our laws, so openly and transparently. Uh, openly and transparently through the IAC. I'm not personally aware of ever having uh, solicited or received any donations from Mr Hansen, but let me, so, let me make the uh, overall point again. The government condemns all breaches of workplace laws, whether it's by unions, employers or employee groups. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, anyone who is guilty of breaching the law should be subject uh, to a relevant uh, court action, which is what happened on this occasion. Uh, what we are suggesting and what LIBOR is obviously fighting against with this line of questioning uh, is that uh, the courts should have more tools available to, de to deal with uh, breaches, uh, consistent uh, breaches of the law uh, by militant unions. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Why does the Prime Minister refuse to demonstrate leadership by moving to expel Mr Hansen from the WA Liberal Party, given he has repeatedly broken the law? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, I'm aware of the report on the weekend. I'm not aware of the allegations that Senator Pratt has just made. Uh, in relation to the reports on the weekend, what I read uh, was the, that he was actually dealt with uh, by the uh, court process in the appropriate way, consistent uh, with our laws, without fear or favour, and that he himself made very clear that he had stopped donating to the Liberal Party and National Parties for some time, for many years, in fact, um, Order and, on my um, left. because, and I'm quoting him as reported, in principle, they were not listening to me. Order. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Minister, can you update the Senate how the Liberal National Government is demonstrating it is on the side of Australians who rely on the development of water in infrastructure in Northern Australia? The Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you much, very much, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald, for that question. I recognise your long-standing passion to see the development of Northern Australia, particularly Northern Australia's water resources. You were passionate about that before you came into this place, and a great addition to this place and that cause you will be, because the government itself is also very passionate about seeing those vast water resources of Northern Australia develop. Northern Australia represents about 40 per cent. Uh, of our nation's continent in terms of land mass, but it accounts for 60 per cent or 2 million gigalitres of the rainfall that falls across Australia in any year. And of course, though, its water resources are largely undeveloped compared to the rest of Australia. The CSIRO estimates that up to 17 million hectares could be irrigated in northern Australia. To put that in context, across the whole country right now, in the Murray-Darling and everywhere else, we only uh, irrigate just over 2 million hectares in any one year. So it's an enormous potential in northern Australia. The federal government, uh, uh, Mr President, as part of our plan to develop northern Australia, is putting aside $700 million to invest in water infrastructure projects because when you capture water, you can use it later on to create jobs, to grow food and help our nation develop. That's why we're putting $176 million towards the Rookwood Weir. Uh, that will be the second biggest piece of water infrastructure in the Fitzroy Basin and help double agricultural production there. $182 million for the Huendon Irrigation Scheme, $54 million for the Big Rocks Weir, the first stage of the Hell's Gate project, and in the election we announced $20 million for more business cases and pre-construction works uh, for the Rana Dam and the Lakelands Dam as well. Lots going on here, Mr President. We also got lots more potential in the future as well. The CSIRO last year did some groundbreaking studies for us, first of its kind in the world more than 100 of its best scientists looking at frontier catchments in the Mitchell region in Cape York, in the Darwin catchments in Northern Territory and the Fitzroy catchment in Western Australia. And they found that there's 387,000 hectares just in those three catchments could create 15,000 jobs. We're getting on with the job of creating those jobs because we're on the side of developing Order, our water Senator resources. Canavan. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. What is the current status of the Rookwood Weir project in central Queensland? Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, I did mention the Rookwood Weir project uh, in an answer to my first question. It is 
uh, we, where I live in central Queensland, near to where I live, and it's a, a massive project that could help dub, double agricultural production there in the Fitzroy catchment. The Fitzroy catchment is the second largest water catchment in eastern Australia after the Murray Darling. It has huge potential to grow and develop, and it is great news that last week the Queensland government finally, finally announced some works on this project, announcing a tender. Uh, for some roads that will need to be upgraded around the project. Uh, the federal government has had money on the table for Rookwood Weir since 2016. They were first off the rank here. We've had money there for now three years. We're just waiting and waiting and waiting, and now it's starting to drip feed out for the people of central Queensland. Maybe the election result had, a, had something to do with that. Uh, but we're hoping, Mr President, that soon we'll see water stored there, the wall poured, maybe next year, hopefully, if the dry season holds up, and we'll get a, a weir there that can create jobs and grow food in central Queensland for all Australians. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. What are the economic benefits of developing water infrastructure like Brookwood Weir for Northern Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Our, the, our agenda to develop Northern Australia is not just for those in Northern Australia. It will help all of our nation because when parts of our nation develop and grow, the rest of the country benefits as well. That's what happened when we built the Snowy Hydro Scheme. The whole country benefited, even though the investment's down there. That's what happened when the Pilbara opened up to iron ore exports in the 1960s and 70s. The whole nation benefited from that, and the development of Northern Australia will also help the whole of Australia benefit and develop too. Because we know that when you create more economic opportunity, you create more jobs. And when you create more jobs, you create more families in Australia who can support themselves. When you have more families who can support themselves, it's a better future for our children and grandchildren in this country. That's why we're developing these water resources. It's not about building the dam. It's about building the opportunity that helps all Australians grow and develop and have a more positive future uh, for our country. All of these projects will help do that, and they are only just the start given the vast array of water resources and good quality soils in our north. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Thank Senator Wong. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Minister Birmingham to questions asked by Senators O'Neill, Billick, and me. Uh, Deputy President, I have to say I don't understand why anyone in this place would waste their political capital on protecting Angus Taylor. Because you know what he's busy using his ministerial position to do? To shore his investments up. Instead of getting people's power bills down, what he's doing is spending his time ensuring his investments' values are retained. Average wholesale power prices have increased by 158 per cent across the national electricity market states since the Liberals' energy crisis began in 2015. Mr Morrison says Angus Mr Taylor has one KPI to be the minister for lower power prices, but you know what he is? The minister to increase the value of his own investments. Angus Taylor failed to declare a direct financial interest in a company. But worse, he then used his position as a minister to defend that company's interests after it was accused of breaking the law. He met with the Department of Environment and Energy and the office of the then minister, now treasurer, in March 2017 to discuss the listing of critically endangered grasslands while the department was investigating the alleged poisoning of the same grasslands on land he part owned. And magically, coincidentally, that meeting occurs the day after federal departmental environmental officials meet with Jamland Proprietary Limited, the company in which he has an interest. What a coincidence! What a coincidence! And of course, an officer of the compliance unit of the department responsible for the investigation was present, which Minister Taylor tries to dismiss airily, airily by saying, "Oh well, actually, we didn't talk about it." Well, following the meeting, the office of the then Minister for the Environment asked for advice about whether he could vary the relevant listing without, against the advice of the Threatened Species Scientific Committee. He asked whether he could act against the committee's advice and whether he could keep the reasons for the variation secret. Again, what a coincidence. Now, earlier today, Minister Taylor made a statement in the House which underlined his complete inability to provide any evidence that he was representing anybody else other than himself. And in fact, as we speak, he's probably still failing to answer questions on that topic. He didn't explain uh, why uh, he didn't register his interests. He didn't explain, uh, he didn't indicate whether there are any other compliance cases, and he didn't explain what he did in relation to a letter he says 
he obtained three years ago. Because the facts are this. Minister Atala says nothing to see here. And what does he point to? A letter three years prior to the meeting that he didn't do anything about, <laughs> and a letter six months after the meeting and a conversation he claims to have had with a bloke from Yass. That's it. <laughs> but somehow, magically, some 24 hours after his company has a meeting or is met with by the Federal Department of the Environment regarding potential contravention of federal environmental laws, the meeting is arranged. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Oh, nothing after 2014. Nothing after the conversation with the bloke from Yes, but the day after the meeting with Jamland Proprietary Limited occurs, magically, Minister Taylor uh, contacted, springs into action, and, and Mr. Frydenberg's office, Mr. Frydenberg's office, uh, office, arranges a meeting. I mean, this is the the same Angus Taylor, of course, who has benefited from the Watergate scandal, where the government paid. $80 million for water rights from a company that Mr Taylor had set up in the Cayman Islands. He's a good bloke, this one. Cayman Islands, asking departments to meet uh, with, with him about, uh, in, uh, about issues affecting the value of his own investment. The fact is, nothing appears to have been done by this minister who claims to represent farmers' interests. Nothing appears to have been done to represent the uh, asserted farmers' interests until his own interests were implicated, until his own interests were reflected, affected. That's the truth of it. Now, I'd encourage any senators who are not intending or are not currently supporting the inquiry into his actions to reflect exactly on who and what they're protecting. They're not protecting everyday, everyday Australians who are being ignored by Mr Taylor as their power bills go up. They're not protecting everyday working Australians who can't pick up the phone to a cabinet colleague to get problems with their investments fixed if they run afoul of the law. And I'd say, if the government doesn't think there's anything to hide, why don't you allow the inquiry to demonstrate you, that? Senator why are you fighting Wong, so hard to expired. hide it? Senator Carr. Thank you very much. Uh, Oh, thank you very much, um, Madam, Pre Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I'm surprised that the government doesn't seek to defend uh, the, their position on this, and, and perhaps upon reflection I shouldn't be. The, I've seen 189 senators come through this chamber in my time here. I've seen some fast and loose footwork undertaken in defence of ministers and attempts to get around the ministerial code of conduct. I've seen uh, governments of all persuasions, I can acknowledge, um, faced with difficulties, seek to slip and slide when it comes to these basic questions which the public is rightfully concerned about. These fundamental issues that go to issues of corruption go to the issues of fundamental accountability, go to the issues of proper public administration. I have seen governments seek to avoid their responsibilities, particularly when individual ministers have paid fast and loose with the truth. But I have not seen examples like this one, where a minister, a junior minister will approach a colleague to organise a briefing on the basis that he's claiming to act for constituents in a name-ring electorate on matters where he claims he's got uh, correspondence three years old and he's done nothing about, and in which he says on technical matters, I'm not interested in discussing the only, the only compliance matter that's before the department at the moment namely his own company, he, of course, claims that this is the purpose by which he is appearing to get a technical briefing. He then, of course, when pushed on this matter, suggests that he's got further correspondence, which is dated six months after the event, in an attempt to pull the wool over the eyes of some uh, senators in this chamber. 
Then following that meeting, the senior minister, minister for the environment, undertakes to get further advice about he could act secretly. I emphasise that word because that's what the word appears in the documents. Secretly to weaken the federal protection standards for grasslands, which are affected by the compliance measure that's being taken against the minister, the junior minister's company. Now, why shouldn't there be some concern expressed about any of that? Now, what we have here is a situation where the minister, the junior minister, Mr. Taylor, in the circumstances, says he has no association with the company, Jamland, that he in fact partly owns. He, of course, then says, well, it's covered by my pecuniary interest statement, except that it's not. He's met the technical requirements, except the main details. He then says, well, of course, I'm going to talk to the department on other matters, except the compliance officer is present in the room. And furthermore, further action is taken to change the regulations, which would allow a review to be undertaken to use for further delay on the listing of those areas that have been subject to the compliance action. Are all done in secret? All done at the request of the junior minister seeking this private briefing. Now, I think there is grounds for an inquiry into that. And Senator Hanson and, and uh, One Nation, I'm told, are having some difficulty coming to terms with this. When I went through Queensland the last election, I noticed billboards that said, I have the guts to say what people are thinking. And this was the pitch that One Nation put to the people of Queensland. Well, I know what the people of Australia are thinking about this type of behaviour. And if One Nation has the guts to say what people are thinking, they'd vote for an inquiry to get to the bottom of these matters and uphold these ministerial standards that most governments say they are actually committed to. This is a government that says Thank it's you, interesting. Senator it should Carr, demonstrate your time it. has expired. I do remind senators that if you are seeking the call, you do need to stand. I don't have the assistance of a list to help me out with names. Um, Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Now, I'm new to this place, and I've heard a lot of talk this afternoon about people's concerns. But I can tell you that I am now wildly concerned, because it seems that there are those on the other side who think that there is only one farmer in Australia. At the big sheep at Goulburn, the home of the big merino, surely that would be an indication that there is more than one farmer in this region. Never been there. Order. I just want to read a little bit of a statement from the minister this morning about you know, there had been strong antagonism expressed by the farming community about federal and state native vegetation regulation for Order. some time. The concern was very serious. The revised listing requires farmers to assess whether there is 50 per cent native vegetation down to parcels of one tenth of a hectare at highly unfavourable times of the year because clover, which is an introduced species, must be excluded from the assessment. It goes well beyond New South Wales regulation and is costly and unmanageable, as it is difficult or impossible to be sure that routine pasture improvement or weed management is compliant. The revised Order. listing will ultimately halt pasture improvement and efficient weed control across the Southern Tablelands and Monaro has the potential to do untold damage to agricultural productivity throughout the region, undermining the livelihoods of many of the 2,500 people who work in agriculture in my electorate. And that's what I want to speak about, is the regulation, particularly around vegetation, that is making it impossible for farmers, particularly in Queensland, who under the state Labor government have been strangled by red tape and regulation that is making it almost impossible to manage the land that they're expected to manage. They have introduced regulation that is difficult to manage, and the department will not respond to questions to, uh, to answer what, um, what practices they are able to use. 
This place should be, a represent should be representative of all parts of Australia. And again, I am terrifically concerned that there is only a few of us here who understand the impost and the impact of regulation on vegetation on the most important people in the country, those people who are growing food and fibre for Australians and for a good part of the world. The recent bushfires in Queensland were a horrific example of what happens when regulation and green tape goes berserk. We were very, very fortunate that no person died in those bushfires, but I can tell you that plenty of animals, plenty of old growth trees and plenty of um, uh, native forests died as a result of, poor, uh, of, of regulation that didn't allow normal farm management practices to happen. Australian agricultural lands have been managed for tens of thousands of years by um, our First Nation people and now by landholders. Those normal practices of fire management were not allowed to be used and resulted in untold damage. I think it is very important that people be able to make representations to manage regulation uh, that is allow not allowing good land management practices to happen. Thank you, uh, Senator Macdonald. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And, uh, can I say, as the duty senator for the seat of Hume, that the people of Hume deserve so much better than what they're getting from Angus Taylor? I can tell you from visiting that electorate many, many times and meeting with farmers myself that the access that this minister has sought for properties that are of interest to him and his family in terms of a direct benefit to him is an extraordinary abuse of the position with which the people of Hume have in endowed him. The best thing you can do if you're a member uh, of uh, the citizenry of the great seat of Hume is find a way to be related to Angus Taylor because it seems to me that he's able to find access to the information that he wants, access to the services that he wants, access to compliance officers at meetings that he wants with regard to how he manages his land and he does it in his own self-interest in a way that other farmers working that land in the seat of Hume are unable to do because Mr Taylor expects privilege. Mr Taylor has exercised privilege in his own interest, in the way in which Senator Wong and Senator Carr have outlined here. The questions that we have been asking Mr Taylor, you'd have to say he's been extremely evasive about. His statement this morning that Minister Birmingham, uh, under the tutelage of the leader of the government here in the Senate, uh, stood behind today, referring to Mr. Mr. Taylor's statement. Mr. Taylor's statement. Mr. Taylor's statement is not worth the paper it's written on, because we have found day after day that Mr. Taylor is doing anything but tell the truth, clearly and cleanly, to the Australian people and to the people of the seat of Hume, exactly what's going on. He's been involved in recent months in that outrageous case of Watergate with 80 million dollars involved. People were outraged then. People in the seat of Hume were outraged to find out that at a local forum in the, in the middle of the election period, Mr Taylor was given access to questions about local matters upon which he uh, had prepared uh, speaking notes made for him by his office. The people against whom he was debating, participating in the democratic process, were not given those questions till hours after Mr Taylor and certainly didn't have the benefit of prepared answers done by staff. Mr Taylor is used to advantage, and that's why he has taken the steps that are on the record with regard to the grasslands uh, that are owned by a company, a family company, that he jointly owns with one third of the shares in a company called Jam Land. What I think is extraordinary is the scale to which Mr. Mr. Um, Mr Taylor has determined he has the capacity to put a snow job over the entire Australian population and this Senate and the House of Representatives. Just last Thursday, Labor was so concerned about this attempt at a layer cake of deception that we've seen from Mr, uh, Mr Taylor that we tried to get up an inquiry through this Senate. 
Now, the way in which Mr Taylor and the government avoided that being voted positively here in the Senate last Thursday was to provide some documentation to some members of the crossbench. Now, sadly, they didn't act quite uh, deceptively enough. And the reality is the dates on those letters now reveal that a letter on which they relied to get crossbench support to hide this from the public, to avoid the scrutiny of a Senate inquiry, was dated seven months after the date on which this incident occurred. So Mr Taylor is relying now on a letter dated well after the event in which he sought to intervene in his own personal interest, and he's also relying on comments from members of uh, a, a, a adjoining seat, the seat of Eden Monera, and also from a commentary that he says is a conversation he had with the, a, a farmer in Yass. Now, there are many good farmers in Yass, but not all of them have access to the offices of Mr Frydenberg. There are many good farmers in Yass and Goulburn who want to do the right thing, who are doing the right thing, who are farming properly and who deserve far better representation than this minister who could not get exercised about anything with regard to these particular grasslands and the management of those grasslands until he received notification that was going to affect him personally. Now, that is a lazy member. That is a deceptive member. That is a member who deserves the scrutiny of this Senate. And this afternoon, when a motion is presented to provide that scrutiny, the crossbench in this place should support it because Mr Taylor does not deserve the Thank support you, of the Senator colleagues who are standing up for has and he deserves that. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, <clears throat> and first of all, in taking note of relevant responses today, may I say that we've had a clear statement in this place from Minister Birmingham regarding Minister Taylor's requirements within the uh, statement of ministerial standards, and I thank the honourable senator for his contribution. But let me be clear, Madam Deputy President, what we have here today is just another parliamentary tactic by the Labor Party to distract from the fact that this government is delivering on our agenda. And why do they want to distract us? Because, Madam Deputy President, the Labor Party is in absolute disarray because they lost the election and, almost two months later, can't work out where it all went wrong. And why did Australians reject Labor's policy platform on the 18th of May? Was it option A, their pledge to wage class warfare, option B, their plan to introduce higher taxes on hardworking Australians, or option C, a reckless spending agenda? Or was it, in fact, option D, all of the above? Certainly during the election campaign and since then, through my conversations with hardworking Tasmanians in my own state, it is abundantly clear to me that Labor's policy platform—a platform to tax, a platform to punish, a platform to curb the ways in which everyday Australians live their lives—is not one that appeals. Australians didn't like what they saw from Labor on the 18th of May, and they still don't like what they see now. Although, at least in the lead-up to election day, it looked like uh, Labor actually stood for something, something that was resoundingly rejected by voters, but still something. Now they stand for nothing except for playing political games in this parliament, continually asking the same questions even though they know the answer, and petulantly opposing our government's mandate. And today's question regarding Minister Taylor is just one of these examples. One thing is for certain, Madam Deputy President, and that is until Labor manages to form some sort of agenda, I have very, very low expectations of that occurring. This Labor opposition will continue to play games in Parliament. In contrast, the Morrison coalition government is focused on getting on with the job and doing what's right by the Australian people, keeping our promises and getting on with our job of governing. We don't need to revert to parliamentary tactics oh, and time-wasting uh, exercises. Just a moment, Senator Chandler, please resume your seat. Senator um, McCarthy. Point of order, uh, Madam Deputy President. I just would like to bring your attention uh, to relevance. I mean, the issue isn't about the election. It's actually about uh, uh, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Senator words. McCarthy. I have been listening very carefully, and it is a broad-ranging uh, discussion. But um, I do believe that Senator Chandler has referred back to the questions um, asked by Labor senators of Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And, and I uh, restate again, in taking note of these responses today, I can't help but reflect on how this chamber's time would be better spent asking and answering questions about this government's plan to make life better for everyday Australians. As I said, uh, th that's what, that is what mature grown-up governments do, and we're getting on with the job. We've delivered tax relief for 10 million working Australians, and we've backed in our farmers with our drought relief fund. We're dealing with foreign terrorist fighters trying to come back to our country with our tough new temporary exclusion orders to keep Australians secure. 
We're helping our hard-working families and, the, and our farmers by progressing legislation to outlaw the activists who are invading our farms. We're giving more power and greater flexibility to the courts to deregister law-breaking unions and take action against certain militant parts of unions and their officials. On every issue, at every turn, Labor has tried to oppose and block our agenda and play these political games. And they've been rightly called out, in fact pilloried, for trying to play these games with pieces of legislation that were not only supported by voters at the election, but are common sense, practical policies to make life better for everyday Australians. And what we're seeing from them today is just a continuation of this counterproductive behaviour. These games, these time-wasting, unnecessary parliamentary tactics are not what Australians voted for. Everyday Australians, Australians voted for a grown-up government that gets the job done. Everyday Australians resoundingly endorsed a government that keeps our economy strong and our future secure. That is what Australians voted for, and that is what this coalition government is setting out to do. In stark contrast, now we have a situation where Labor clearly don't want to talk about policies anymore, so instead they are going to play the man. Why, Madam Deputy President, why would Labor stop giving Australians a tax cut? Why would Labor oppose locking in funding for our drought-affected communities? Why would Labor oppose legislation which seeks to ensure unions and union officials act within the law? Those are the questions, Madam Deputy President, that have Australians wondering what on earth Labor have been doing since the election. Whose side are they on? Whose side is Labor on, Madam Deputy President? Are they on the side of hardworking Australians, hardworking Australians who deserve tax relief, who deserve to have their next generations employable and appropriately trained for the jobs of the future? Whose side is the Labor Party on? Because, Madam Deputy President, it is clearly not the side of everyday Australians. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Uh, yes, um, Senator Faruqi. I rise to take note of the responses Minister Payne gave to my questions on climate change, Pacific Nations and the foreign aid program. Pacific Nations have repeatedly identified climate change as the single greatest threat to their security. For decades, they have been calling on Australia to do more to reduce its carbon emissions. Um, Senator Faruqi, sorry, um, what, who are you taking note of? Responses Minister oh, Payne gave to my question. Sorry, sorry. I said that. Yeah. Over the last few weeks, the Foreign Minister has, multiple has had multiple opportunities to address the demands by Pacific Island nations to act on climate change, but has refused to do so. Instead, Australia has told the leaders of Pacific Island nations that they should be pleased with Australia's efforts. What should they be pleased with, Minister? The fact that your government approved the Adani coal mine, which will be a massive contributor to climate change, or the fact that Australia's export credit agency, FX Capital, has increased sixfold with the clear mandate to pursue Australian interests with no regards to our neighbours. We know what this means, unfettered access to taxpayer money to fast-track fossil fuel projects in the region. This undermines the climate action on which the safety of the Pacific depends. And this is really a slap in the face to our Pacific neighbours, who have urged us time and time again to wean ourselves off coal and our addiction to climate pollution. Minister Payne was in Fiji just last week, conducting meetings behind closed doors to make sure, as the Australian reported, that there is no climate stoush at the upcoming Pacific Islanders Forum. Shamefully, Australia is bringing nothing to the table at the forum to address this existential threat posed by the climate breakdown to our Pacific Island neighbours. Australia's real interests in the Pacific have been exposed time and again, with successive governments looking to continue an extractive relationship with our neighbours. The government's decision to approve the Adani coal mine and their ever-increasing export of coal and gas, with the emissions from this having doubled since 2000 and now more than double of our, global, of our domestic emissions, which really makes us a bully in the region, pushing ahead with an agenda dictated by the fossil fuel lobby and others who profiteer from the death of our planet. This agenda condemns our neighbours in the Pacific to rising sea levels and dislocation, to severe storms and to a loss of arable land and drinking water. Coal is the leading contributor to global climate change, and Australia, sadly, is the biggest exporter of coal. 80% of the coal that is dug up in Australia is shipped 
overseas to be burned, making Australia an international pariah and one of the biggest contributors to the growing climate emergency. It is Australia's addiction to coal and the bipartisan commitment to taking donations from the fossil fuel industry that have made sure we continue to relentlessly pursue this agenda. There's no way we will achieve the Paris Agreement targets under this government's present trajectory. The minister has been also sitting on the strategy for climate change in our aid program prepared by DFAT. The draft has been on a desk for more than six months now. This shows how little attention climate change gets in our overseas aid program with this government at the helm. As the region's leading contributor to dirty emissions and a major fossil fuel exporter, it is our responsibility to do more. A just foreign aid program would not look like a checkbox exercise where there is hardly any funding and practically no focus on climate change and resilience. Climate justice would mean that we should drastically cut our emissions. It means that there is a huge investment in climate resilient infrastructure in the Pacific region. Through our overseas aid and international development program, we should be doing much more to support climate resilience in our Pacific neighbors. Pacific Islanders are at the front line of climate change, and that is caused by global giants like Australia who have failed to curb their emissions, who have failed to rein in their addiction to burning and exporting fossil fuels, and lastly, who have failed in their obligation to be a good global citizen. It is not the fault of Pacific Island nations that they find themselves faced with rising sea levels. We know that developing countries have contributed very little to global warming and climate change, but now face some of the worst consequences. Our aid program should reflect this debt. It is a matter of global justice. We owe it to our Pacific Island nations and the world. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. And uh, we'll go back to the motion as moved by uh, Senator Wong. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.